Welcome to another episode of the Obscurity to Authority podcast. Today we have a really exciting guest with us. We have Robert Burko, the CEO of Elite Digital. Robert, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. I really appreciate the time. We're going to be covering a very interesting story of Robert's and how he built an incredible digital marketing agency over the last, what is it, 17 years? Yeah, crazy. Wow, 17 years. So not like the guys that are popping up on Facebook now saying I'm an agency owner like three months ago. You were doing it like back in the day. But I was you... doing it back in the day. <laughs> Before Instagram? Before Instagram, oh, I when Facebook was I remember when Facebook was new. Absolutely. See, that that's that's a big opportunity. This is the Obscurity to Authority Podcast with your host, Darren Cabral. So today we're gonna to go through that story. I wanna talk a little bit about just how this is kinda of gonna go down. So basically on today's show, we're gonna go through your story, the man behind the business, so to speak, the man behind the brand, because everyone can talk about you know the shiny stuff, where we end up, the results now, we have a beautiful office behind us, but it doesn't always start there, right? There is a lot of challenge, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of indecision, there's a lot of choices that have to be made, there's so much that goes into that. So I wanna I want to figure out kind of what your journey was as you built this company, but I also wanna know what kind of person you were before this, because I think a lot of people have um, kind of a preconceived notion of maybe I can't be an entrepreneur if I don't have a specific skill or I have to be special or my parents have to be rich or I have to, whatever the preconception they have is, I know that to not be true. And so I want to shatter that because I think that in most cases, most people can achieve success and it is in their control and a lot of it is in their power and they're not just at the whim of their circumstance. So hopefully we can take you back to your original story as well and shed some light on that. Cool? Happy to take a trip down memory lane. Absolutely. Awesome. Always fun. Awesome. So hey, let's, before we get into that, I said you're the CEO of Elite Digital. Why don't you give us a quick rundown on Elite Digital? Yeah, absolutely. So Elite Digital is um, really Canada's premier digital marketing agency. So we're a full service digital marketing agency. We have over 75 subject matter experts wow. that span the entire digital ecosystem. Huh. So the really great thing for us is a lot of agencies uh, or companies specialize on one thing. You know, yeah. We do search marketing, we do design, we do, we do apps. Uh, we do it all. And the wow. reason that's really important is because rarely does a company of any size yeah. need just one thing. You know, there's rarely a company that says, oh, search marketing is all I need and that's the holy grail. <laughs> it's about the digital marketing landscape. Right. So here what we do is we'll engage a client and basically say, you know, tell us your goals, tell us your pain points, where do right. you want to be? Point me to what a home run looks like. Mm. And because we span the entire digital ecosystem, we could figure out, okay, you need a new website, we need marketing automation, we're going to need some search marketing, we need some SEO, we need some organic social, we need some paid social, we got to do some webinars, we need these lead funnels, we need an app. So we look at it holistically and say, how do I get you from here to where you want to be? Wow. And because we span the whole ecosystem, mm -hmm. we can really figure out what the right marketing mix is right. instead of saying, well, we only do one thing, so that better be the answer. So clients end up seeing a lot more value because we can mix and match between different tactics and tools in our toolbox. Right, see that's incredible. And I mean, what you guys have done very well, which I like is you're not just 10 people saying we do everything and everyone does a little bit of it all. You kind of have a department for each of those areas, whether it be development or it's social media, you have dedicated teams, almost mini agencies within the whole, right? Absolutely, so I mean, you know, one of the things I always say, you know, if you're, if you're the master, you know, if you're the jack of all trades, you're the master of none. Right, mm. and for the jack of all trades of the master of none is a very true statement because I see other you know startups, for example, saying we have Joe and Joe sits in the corner and he's our social media guy, our graphic designer, our analyst, our strategic planner, and he does all these things. Wow. And the problem is when one person does all those things, right. all the credit to that guy, no problem or girl, but they can't be best in class at that. Right. And because what we want to deliver to our clients is truly best in class solutions, right? Yeah. You can go anywhere else, what you get here at Elite Digital is going to be better. And the reason it's yeah. better is we have top talent that is hyper-focused on huh. their area of specialty. So our SEO team just focuses on SEO, our web developers just focus on that, our UI team, our UX team, our media team, they all focus on exactly what they need to focus on and then we can operate at a higher level. Yeah. And when you bring all those people together to work on a campaign for a client, real magic happens because the level you're at and the quality and caliber right. of work right. becomes inspiring. And they're all working within the same agency. So it's not like you have five agencies trying to communicate different processes and all this. Yeah, and one, I mean, one thing yeah. I always joke around with clients is, you know, with us, it's uh, one throat to choke. 
Hmm. which maybe is the wrong sentiment, but at the same time, every client I talk to yeah. says the last thing I want is 10 status calls with 10 different agencies where everybody's finger pointing, I need this from them. Here, right. you know, the strategy is cohesive, which is critically important, right. but also the left hand knows what the right hand is doing because they're sitting across from each exactly. other. And that synergy that you get from being in the same space and having one agency do it all hmm. really adds a lot of value and to our clients preserves their sanity because they're talking to one team and then it's go, make magic. Yeah. Yeah. happen as opposed yeah. to different pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. No, it's amazing and how you pull that off is amazing because I, I know firsthand the difficulty in doing that and part of that is you have to find all these talented people in all these different areas and I think a lot of the struggle, a lot of young entrepreneurs, a lot of people are trying to start agencies these days, quote unquote, um, and the struggle with it is where do you start? You have all these teams, you can't start by hiring them all at once. Do you start with just one division like email and then expand to other divisions? Do you start with one person in each division? So maybe we can dig into that now unless you have kind of an answer. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, in all fairness, yeah. again, it took me, you know, 17 years to get to where we are now. Mm. If we sat and had this conversation 10 years ago, right. I'm not saying I got 75 <laughs> little pe people, little mini agencies out there in different departments and all coming together in cohesive strategy. I mean, yeah. it wasn't always like that. Right. I wish it was always like that. It right. would have been easier. Exactly. Uh, you know, it's a grind to get there and at a certain point in time you do have people that are wearing multiple hats right. and you know if I jump back when I started the company you know I was in high school I was a goofy teenager yeah, I didn't yeah, know yeah. anything and when I started it I, I didn't have a lot of money to hire people at all right so I actually when I started this yeah. I had to learn Photoshop and learn Illustrator and learn programming yeah. and learn SEO so you know even little things I had to learn accounting I had to learn QuickBooks yeah, so exactly because I couldn't actually hire staff to do what I needed when yeah. I started I was literally Everybody. wearing 20 different hats. And yeah. then gradually yeah. over time, yeah. you start to say, hey, you know, you could do this better than me. Yeah. Hey, designer, you're a far more talented designer than yeah. I am. Yeah. You do this, I'm not gonna do this anymore. Yes. Right? There was a yes. time 15 years ago, I opened Photoshop every day. Yeah. Now, I don't have Photoshop on my computer anymore yeah. because someone who's better at it is doing it. Exactly, and that's so important because so many people are trying to start something, like I said, they see that end result and it's almost overwhelming because how do I get there? I'm just one person, I'm doing this all by myself. I don't know how to get there, but you're proof that it does start there. It does start with you wearing all the hats and slowly you pass those hats off, correct? Absolutely, I mean, you have to walk before you run. Right. Uh, you know, I always joke, you know, I hear people say the word overnight success. Right. Yeah. And to me, I mean, maybe that yeah. exists. I would tell you that's a myth. Right. right? Exactly. Maybe the Easter Bunny delivers overnight success. I have no <laughs> idea. But, you know, the idea of you wake up the next day and you're wildly successful and right. you have everything, you know, your dreams came true. Right. I don't think it happens. I think you have to work towards it. And I think it's a grind. I agree. And I think it's, you know, you learn from your mistakes and you, you grow organically. And yeah. even here, because we had years where we grew dramatically, you know, years right. of, you know, you know, we had years of 600% growth, 700% yeah. growth. Yeah. I mean, even that was a struggle to scale at that point yes. because you still need top talent and you have to figure out, exactly. okay, how do I start dipping up the hats? How do we yeah. scale and maintain the same level of quality? Yep. But I do think it's about organic growth. I think it's about slow and steady. How do you, yes. how are you better tomorrow than you were yesterday? Yes, that's a great point. And you mentioned, so you mentioned you did start this back in high school. I this is something you've been doing since high school. Uh, yeah, wow. I've been doing this a long time. So I was gonna go back to high school days assuming you've done nothing, you were just still in school, but you're already busy. So why don't you take me back to that? What was going on for you in high school? Like, take us right back to that. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I was back in high school, mm -hmm. uh, you know, goofy teenager, mm -hmm. uh, you know, having, uh, having fun. And at the time, so my father, mm -hmm. um, who is someone I really look up to, he he runs his own business. Nice. So I always knew sort of entrepreneurship was was in my family. My brother runs his own business. My what, sister what does runs, he do, if you don't mind me asking? So my father runs a company called Airtime. It's a television advertising company. Nice. Very so if you cool. wanted to get commercials on TV, you he know, does you'd that. call him and he would get it on the air. That's amazing. Type of thing. So I always knew I had a passion for entrepreneurship right, and business. Right. I mean, that was sort of, I'll say that was ingrained in my yeah, DNA. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, I had that. I also knew I had a passion for technology. Yeah. I just I was always just sort of drawn to it. Right. So I knew I liked business and marketing and technology. So I knew I wanted to do something. Mm. And I mean, at the time, the internet was new, which you know people hear that now. And you know, even crazy. I have three little kids at home, and to them thinking the internet was new, like they'll they've grown up with <laughs> yeah. iPad as an extension of another limb of their body. <laughs> so you know, but for me, it was, the internet was new. Yeah. There's a I'm in a CBC documentary that talks about the emerging social media industry, right. where the big new thing I unveiled for a client was a Facebook page. And there's a documentary about that. Um, and today, that'd be like, oh my God, anyone can click the button and do that. And that was at the time. Yeah. So I knew I had that passion. So I yeah. started off creating something, uh, it was an internet portal similar to Yahoo. Right. Because at the time, 
I sort of knew where my passion was, but I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do. Right. So I had a search engine, a lottery portal, a news site. I had this thing called Elite Clubs, which was similar wow. to Facebook before Facebook, yeah. where it was file sharing and photo sharing and status updates. And then I had this business arm to it, where I had email marketing and an HR solution and websites. Wow. And I had all this stuff. And what I rapidly figured out you know, was, what were you thinking? You know, you're a small startup, you're literally working in your parents' basement, how are you doing this much stuff? Yeah. So after realizing I had bit off more than I could chew, uh, which I think was an important realization, right. I said, all right, we have to focus on one thing, right? I need to go all in, all the chips on the table for one specific thing, and we focused on email marketing. Yes. Because at the time, you know, and again, email marketing was still new. Yep. I had created Canada's first cloud-based email marketing software. Wow. It wasn't even called the cloud at that point. It was called software as a service. And we right. gradually figured out that was not a sexy term, so we're going to call it the cloud. Right. Uh, but I created that, and I said, we're going to focus on this because it really harnesses my passion for marketing mm. and my passion for technology. Because it's going to be email marketing. It was brand new. Everybody had to do it. Nobody was doing it. And again, these days you think everybody has a mailing list, but at the time right. no one did. Right. So focused all on email and launched Elite Email, which was the first uh, email marketing platform in Canada. Had a lot of success with that. Yep. And it just sort of snowballed because people were loving what we were doing. Mm. And they'd call us up and they'd say, hey, we love what you're doing for email. Can you help with my website? And we'd say, no, <laughs> we don't help with websites. We just do email and that's what we do. Until I sort of had this epiphany moment where it was, why are we saying no? Right. Why don't we say yes? Yeah. Uh, so we started saying yes. Yeah. And then suddenly we started saying, okay, now we're building websites. And then, oh, we built your website. And they said, hey, huh. can you help with our social media? Sure, we can help with your social yeah. media. No. Hey, can you help with our Google SEO? Yeah, we absolutely can. And this was gradually over time. Right. But that idea and attitude of, Let's say yes, let's not say no. Let's embrace sort of the, where this organic journey right. is taking us. Kind of led me from this internet portal that I had when I was a teenager to this email marketing platform to now became an agency hmm. where we sort of do it all. So, I mean, I'm telling you that story in a few sentences, but that's years and years right. over time. Right. But I think it was about, as an entrepreneur, identifying where the trends are, yes. not digging in my heels that this is what we do, but rather right. embracing Let's see where tomorrow leads right. us, and let's right. chase that dream. Right, being focused, but also being flexible. You did go all in on something, but you weren't afraid to pivot. You weren't afraid to move and chase that opportunity as it came through. Absolutely, I think you have to be as an entrepreneur. I mean, you know, and you have those examples, right? Mm. Blockbuster could have bought Netflix. Mm -hmm. They didn't, right? They said no. This is what we do. What a mistake, right? You know, even Polaroid. There's all these examples yeah. of companies that had to innovate and had to yes, say, yes. this may be what we do, but what does tomorrow hold right, for us? Right. So I think that was always my strategy is, you know, if I close all these doors, no doors are gonna be open to me. Hmm. And if I sort of embrace, you know, yeah, we could do that, let's try that out, you know, let's explore that avenue. Right. I think it opens up a lot more opportunity and it let us evolve and grow and it let me grow as an entrepreneur. Interesting, and so that's really, that's really cool because you got right into this right away, right in high school and most people are still just figuring out their lives. I mean, nowadays you're 30 and you still are in your parents' basement, you don't even know what you wanna do for work. You're maybe going back to school. So you had that clarity. I wanna find out how early was that clarity there? Like how young were you when you realized I want to be an entrepreneur. Maybe did your dad take you to work? Like, did you see that early on? Like, when did that hit you? Yeah. So I mean, I think I think it was interesting. So I think it was really early on mm. that I was like, I knew I wanted to do something on my own. Yeah. Didn't necessarily know what it was, right. but I knew I wanted to do something because yeah. it was sort of like I saw that in my family. Right. Right. Yes. You know, even my, you know my my uncles and everyone. You know, everyone in my family seemed to be very entrepreneurial. Right. So I knew I wanted to do something. Right. And then it was like, okay, well, what am I going to do? Right. And don't get me wrong. At the beginning, it was difficult. So I'm a teenager. So I'm in school during the day. I'm coming home. Like let's say on a Friday. Yeah. School during the day. Come home. Work on my company. Yeah. Yeah. Then go out partying, drinking with friends. <laughs> you know come home, go to bed, wake up the next day, right. study for an exam, work for my company, go out again. So this idea of student by day, entrepreneur yeah, by yeah, night, yeah, yeah. even just saying that now reminds me how tiring that was. It is, yeah. Because it also creates this conflict, right? Like, you know, even I remember when I was working on it through university, I'd be like, I'm studying for an exam to do a fake case study on a fake company, <laughs> and I'm working on that fake case study instead of my real company. Yes. And it becomes this interesting balancing act of, yes. oh my gosh, there's only so many hours in the day, how do I get it done? But I think that's where, you know, me being a workaholic, right. I can go, go, go. You know, to me, there's 24 hours a day where I could be getting something done. And in those younger years, certainly before I had kids, 
It was, you know, I was either a student and I was going all in on that. Right. I was either the entrepreneur and that got 100% of my effort yeah. or I was out having fun. Yeah. And it was like whatever I was focused on, I had to be like so hyper-focused and all in on all that because in. I had to switch modes so fast mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and really excel at each one of those buckets. Interesting. So what drew you to, I mean, you had all these things going on. You had all these balls in the air, so to speak. You said you had a passion for all of it. I mean, there probably was opportunity in many of them, not just the marketing side. I'm sure there was plenty in the web development and the software and the SaaS model stuff. I'm sure there was tons. What really drew you to marketing and said, no, the marketing is the thing that I'm going to go all in on. Was it an experience you had? Like what brought you to that? So I think it's my love. It's two things. One, I think it's my love of being able to uh, change consumer behaviors. Mm. So, I mean, I love a good challenge. Above all else, I'm fueled by a good challenge. So I love, you know, hey, I have this product. You know, this company will say, hey, I have this product. Yeah. No one's buying it today and I need them to buy it. Right. And then I have to figure out how I could take this mass perception of the public yeah. and get them to say, hey, I want that. Yeah. And then it gets even more fun because there's other products in the market that are the same. So now we talk about branding and how can I build an affinity to that brand? Right. So right. I love the right. idea of, you know, how can we be strategic in changing consumer behaviors to get them to achieve the action we want? Yes. To me is a challenge that marketing, really that's what it is. I mean, that's what marketing is about. And the other reason I love marketing is, and one of the reasons why we didn't really focus on one niche here mm -hmm. at Elite is I like jumping from challenge to challenge, problem to problem, yes. right? Yes. So I like that, you know, we work a lot in healthcare. So I have mm -hmm. a lot of pharma clients. Yeah. So my morning could be, I'm helping something with a pharma client. Yeah. And then I switch to a big CPG company. And then I switch to a financial company. And then I switch to an academic institution. Mm -hmm. So across any calendar day for me, I could be operating in five or six or seven yes. different industries. Yes. And I love that. Yes. Like there's no, every, you know, no two days are the same for me. Hmm. And marketing gives me that benefit and luxury yeah, because yeah. I can work across this gamut of, you know, I need this doctor to prescribe more, but I got to sell more of those chips right. and I got to sell, you know, I got to get more people <laughs> to this bank. And that to me is fun. It drives you crazy and it's fun because I'm the same way. It's that's why I'm smiling as you're saying that. I got into marketing for exactly that reason. I had different startups before that. I've sold some things before I got into marketing and I realized I had this problem where when you give me one industry, you get good at it, you build something and you're like, what's next? You want to try something else? And you have this yeah. like craving for, and marketing was the perfect solution because same with us, like we never went into a niche. Like we were obviously the social media marketing company I mentioned uh, is what I run and we never picked a specific niche. And part of that was even though all the business advisors now and the gurus and the consultants say, oh, I got to find your niche, got to find your niche. That's not what made me happy. You go into one niche and then what? It's exciting, like you said, to go from one industry to another industry to another industry. And maybe that's just the way our minds work. But I totally resonate with that. It's exactly what I thought, exactly why I did it. Um, and that's why I asked. I was curious if you got into it for the same reasons. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the number one thing, you know, as we talk about entrepreneurship, the number mm. one thing that I think is important is passion. Mm. Above all else, I will tell yeah. you, I love this as much today as I did when I was a teenager, you know, m almost two decades ago, yeah. right? So I think that passion is important. And I think if you love what you do, mm. you're willing to go all in and, and, and really sort of go the extra mile and nothing can hold you back. Right. And for me, my passion extends to sort of, you know, helping different clients solve the problem. And I love just you know, having that depth and breadth of sort of different verticals that I can play in. Right. So we are niche focused in the sense we do marketing. Yeah. And yet inside of that sphere, I can work with all these different companies and impact lives in different ways and change consumer behaviors in different ways. I love it. And so you mentioned part of that is all these different challenges. So I want to talk just because I mean, entrepreneurship, as you know, of course, is not always smooth sailing. Ha. So <laughs> oh, how I wish it was. <laughs> you and me both. What's one of the largest challenges you've had to overcome, whether it's just a business growth challenge or a client problem you ran into? What's one of the biggest challenges that you really had to push to get through? So I don't think it's one specific challenge. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that I had to learn as an entrepreneur, which, which I always, when I'm talking to people, I say is an important entrepreneurial lesson. The thing to learn is failures are learning opportunities. Right. And, and my father really ingrained that in me because yes. any entrepreneur who says he, didn't, he or she didn't fail, they're lying. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, no one is just, I'm always successful and everything yeah. I touch turns to gold. And if you are, yeah. great, more power to you. Yeah. But yeah. I think what I had to learn as an entrepreneur was you are going to get knocked down. Mm -hmm. What matters isn't that you got knocked down, it's how quickly do you get back up and what did you learn from that? So for me, that's always what it was, especially as I started so young, right? right? So, you know, when you're 16, 17 years old, 
Well, what do you, you don't Nothing know, you don't know here, anything. Yeah. You don't, you think you know everything, yeah. right? If you were, you know, if I go back and talk to past Rob of yeah. 20 years ago, yeah. that guy thought he knew everything. Right. Present day Rob is like, that guy knew nothing. <laughs> but I think the important thing was understanding I failed, yes. you know, or this didn't go the way I yes. wanted. I'm upset. And I think, you know, it's easy to say, you know, I'm down on the mat and not gonna get back up. Right. Wow, I got kicked and I'm down and that's it. This is the end of me and game over. Right. And I think game over not being an option is important. Right. And I think saying, okay, this is, what, this is what happened, here's the decision I made, what can I do to be better? Yes. Could I have gotten more information? What could I have learned from it? Right. And even as I think back on the last you know, 15, 20 years of this journey, hmm. where I am today is only a function of all the failures and mistakes I've made before. Yeah. Right? Fool me once, you know, fool me twice, right? So it's about how can I take that, learn from it, be right. better right. from it. And that's what I think a lot of young entrepreneurs especially struggle with because they don't expect that. And I think it's partially, I mean, not to get political, it's not really political, but education systems these days, they kind of tend, especially in the earlier ages, prime you for failure bad, right answer good. Memorize this and put it down, wrong or right. And it's just very black and white. But in entrepreneurship, it's not that. And they'll have their first failure and figure, well, I'm just not good enough. I did it wrong. I failed. I'm done. But really, it's like you said, having that commitment, I think is so important knowing there is no other option and just committing to no matter what happens, I'll figure out how to do it better and I'll keep going forward towards the mission. I think we just can't give up because that's something I try to tell a lot of young entrepreneurs as well that I talk to. They have to let that click into their head. You have to fail. You're going to have to fail. Not because it's sexy to say that or it's popular, but because no one knows everything. Like you said, like no one has this clear, perfect vision. You're going to have to go figure it out as you do it, make the mistakes to become the person you're going to need to become to build something like what you've done now. So that's super important, right? Absolutely. I will tell you, I'm mean, looking back on this journey, I have learned a lot more from my failures than oh, I yeah. have from my successes. Oh, yeah. The successes are more fun, yes. no doubt, but you learn a lot more from the yes. failures. And I think as an entrepreneur, if you understand that failures are learning opportunities yeah. and you really appreciate the fact of, you know, okay, what could I have done differently? How could I be better? How could I be a better person tomorrow? How could I have made a better choice? What information was I missing? You know, all of that sort of figuring it out like a puzzle, if you embrace that as the journey, then when you fail, you're not like, oh man, I can't believe I failed. Right. You're, I'm about to learn something new right. and then I'll be better for it. Hmm. And I still take that with me today. Yeah. You know, I'm not, we're, we're all far from perfect, right. right? I'm the first one right. to admit, I make mistakes all the time. Yeah. And to me, it's always like, I made a mistake, what can I learn from it? Right. And how can I be better tomorrow? Yes. And I think if entrepreneurs understand that, yeah then failures aren't failures, yeah. right? And then yeah. you go on that journey and you charge onward. And I think if you have the attitude of, you know, and again, it comes back to passion, yeah. failure is not an option. I had to push through whatever obstacle it was, yes. no matter how giant it seemed, oh my God, yes. we're never gonna yes. overcome this. No, we have to overcome yeah. this. There yeah. is no other option. Yeah. And you always come out better on the other side. That's Absolutely. all the growth. I'm actually weary of successes these days because I, I tend to under-celebrate wins and successes because those start to scare me because everyone sees these wins and now everyone's really calm and everyone thinks they're doing such a great job and sure enough, that's where the next mistake comes out of. So the wins, when we see wins, to me, it's just, you did your job. You're on the right path, but keep going. Don't stop and celebrate and slow down and think it's all over. For me, I love the failures the same way because I know that, okay, that's something I didn't know. It's good to learn that now. We're gonna get better. We're gonna come out of it. It keeps everyone on their toes. It keeps everyone alert. It keeps everyone trying to grow. I like having those. Successes, I've never seen a company built just on the back of endless successes. Absolutely, I mean, one of our core values here at Elite mm -hmm. is basically always be learning. And I think that's so important. Amazing. Because as soon as you stop learning, as soon as you stop challenging yeah. yourself at any stage of the journey, yes. you know, if you're standing still, you're falling behind. 100%. what I tell people. 100%. So the fact that we have this you know, attitude of always be learning. I yeah. always want everybody here, and we have a, a lot of amazing, talented people that are truly, I mean, our people are, are our secret sauce. There's yeah. no doubt about it. Yeah. But I want everybody to learn and grow. Yeah. I want everybody, you know, even if they come here, stay a while and leave, I want to make sure they say, my time at Elite, my journey here, I came out better and smarter and stronger than when I started. Because I want to challenge people. I want them to learn something mm -hmm. new. Because we don't know it all. Yeah. And I think even me as an entrepreneur, yeah. the challenges in what I'm learning today with a staff here and, you know, 75 plus, plus abroad and everything else, yeah. what I'm learning today is different than what I learned 10 years ago. Right. And what I'm going to learn 10 years from now will probably be different. But the moment I think there's nothing for me to learn, that's the moment we're in trouble, yeah. right? I never want to think we have all the yeah. answers. Yeah. I want to think we can be better and we continually be on this quest for improvement. And I think that's been one of the things that makes us better. Mm. If you're never satisfied with the status quo, you're always striving for more. 
Right. And I think that's important. I think that's sort of who we are as a company. I think it's a key part of our culture is that idea of always be learning. Right. I love that. I was smiling when you said that too, just because we have exactly the same core value. We have eight of them, and one of them is that exact line that you just said. Because yeah. I think there's a big misconception with uh, people coming out of college and universities that that's your education. You go through college, you go through university, you did your education, you did your learning, and now it's time for work. And I'm sure there's plenty of people who, after that college or university, never pick up a book again. Yeah. Right? So how do you feel about that? Like, is, is there any truth to that when people say, I went to school, I'm done my learning, I can get through? Or do you think they have to be always constantly learning, not just an agency, any job? Is this important? Anyone? For anywhere? I would say everybody everywhere should yeah. constantly be on a quest for always learning. I mean, no doubt about it. You can't simply say, I graduated on the day I walked across that stage and got my diploma, my learning right. journey was done. Because I think you're gonna be very bored the rest of your life. Yeah. I think we all, as human beings, I think we want to be learning. I think we're all striving for growth yeah. in some way, shape, or form. Which does not mean pick up and study a book. I don't give my staff here you know, pop quizzes and exams. Yeah. But there's a different style of learning. There's new skills to pick up. Yeah. And I think that idea is very important. And everyone has to be on this mission to always be learning. And society as a whole will be better when we're all collectively all learning more. I love it. Okay, awesome. So my next question, now that we've talked about business and your success here building the agency, I want to talk about marketing because we cover the entrepreneurial base. We're helping all our entrepreneurs, but I know there's a lot of business owners listening as well. They're building companies. They want to market. They're learning. And I've noticed there's a lot of hunger right now, especially with the smaller businesses. They want to know what they can do, how they can grow. So I'm going to jump right into it with this question. How important is digital marketing in 2020? I would say it's the most important. Mm. Um, and that's not me being biased because right. I run a digital agency because certainly that'd be the easiest answer. Right. That's not my reason. My reason is, you know, digital is not a fad, okay? Social media is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. No one's gonna wake up tomorrow and decide, you know what, the internet, this thing, we're just not interested right, in it, okay? Right. It's here to stay. Now, I'm not knocking traditional media, right. but if you're a small business just starting out and you go to see what it costs to take out a full page ad in the newspaper, mm -hmm. It's cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. You can't run a national TV campaign mm -hmm. on a startup budget. It doesn't make any sense. No. And more so than that, more so than the cost being too much, it doesn't make sense in terms of the targeting. So, you know, mass, traditional media, traditional mass, me, mass media mm -hmm. is more a spray and pray approach. Right. 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 I'm going right. to show my ad to a ton of people yeah. and I hope that some people in that pocket are my customer. Right. Okay. Right. No problem. Digital media is the opposite. Digital media is laser focused. Digital media is my customers are 18 to 25 year old males right. who right. have this interest, who live yes. in the city, who do this, 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 go get them. I always talk when I talk to clients, even bigger clients who are moving, you know, we move a lot of clients from broadcast to a YouTube campaign, for example, right. and I talk about, you know, working dollars. Mm -hmm. When you run that ad, how many of the wrong people saw it? That's yeah. wasted dollars. Yeah. Burn those, burn that money. Yeah. And that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And if you're a startup, there is no money to burn. Every penny matters. Yeah. So with digital marketing, you can be hyper-focused and say, I need to get the right message in front of the right audience at the right time, right. in the right place, because that's gonna drive conversions or sales or goals, whatever you're shooting mm -hmm. for. You get that money, you reinvest, same strategy, and you build this cycle. But as soon as you start throwing money into we're gonna print flyers and just drop them all over the city. <laughs> Great, you spent more money than you yeah, had to yeah. on a less effective tactic. Yeah. So digital marketing is the answer to what they need mm. and we're fortunate enough to live in a day and age where you can be a startup and still do the same type of digital marketing that the biggest brands are doing. Mm -hmm. So the biggest brands in the country are doing search marketing. A small startup guy sitting in his basement in his can underwear can also do yes. search marketing. Yes. Now, that is not the same scale, and I don't want to pretend right. that it is. Exactly. But the idea of the tactic, someone's going to go to a search engine like Google, right. type in something, my product is the answer. Right. I can play in the same sandbox as them. Right. Right. Not the same size, but I can play in that same yeah. tactic. Yeah. And you have to. Because if you don't, you're yeah. not going to be relevant and it's going to be very hard to move the needle. Yeah, yeah, and we see that all the time. We see a lot of times the small businesses are competing right alongside the large brands because, yes, the large brand is doing it across the country or across the continent or across the world. But when it comes down to it, if there's a local business, let's say, you know, here in North York and there's another national brand marketing in North York and they're both hitting for the same search terms, there's a possibility they're both going to come up or one or the other is going to come up. That happens. And it's, it's to me, it's just a great equalizer. 
it allows them to play in the same field, which is perfect. Yeah, I mean, and there's there's a savviness to it as well. So right. here at Elite Digital, we work with big national brands, yeah. obviously, yeah. right? Some of the biggest brands in the country. Yeah. And we also work with small, medium-sized businesses. Mm. And we see both ends of the scale. So we've seen the small guy competing with the big guys trying to get any market share. And we've seen the big guys who are like, can you grow our market share by 1% because that would right. be the record year for us. We see <laughs> both ends of the scale. Yeah. And I think what's important is understanding how can you strategically apply your marketing budget, whatever it is, at whatever size, right. to achieve your results. Mm. And there's a variety of different things you can do. Yeah. There's times we just do search, there's times we look at you know search to drive email because then we could do marketing automation and then we're right. not paying for ads. There's right. times we do you know Instagram, there's times we do LinkedIn. Right. I think it's about saying, this is the bucket of money I have for marketing. Yeah. Whatever it is, the small guy saying I have $5 and the big company saying I have $5 right. million. Dollars. Right. This is what I'm trying to achieve. Yep where we fill in the blanks and where we champion your journey to success yeah. is how can I get you from A to B? What do we have to do to mm -hmm. make the most of that? Mm -hmm. And then when you as an entrepreneur reinvest, you start growing and growing and growing and yeah. you get more word of mouth. But to answer your question, digital marketing, that is your tactic. That is your roadmap to success. I, I think what the average entrepreneur doesn't know is simply what's out there. Exactly. They don't know what they can be doing. So when they yes. sit there scratching their head, oh, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? I'm sitting here with my team saying, there's 50 things on the yeah. menu you can choose from. Yeah. They're sitting at home saying, what's on the menu? Right. Right. And then you run into a gap because you don't know what you don't know. Yes, exactly. And that's what I find. The most common objection to the companies that are still not leveraging digital um, is their, their real objection. They don't realize it just because they don't understand what it is. They don't really know what they're missing out on because they've not seen it or used it. So what do you say to these business owners, whether small, medium, or large, because they all exist in every size category, the ones that say, well, listen, we run radio right now. We run print right now, and it's working fine. Why mess with it? So I say to them the same thing, and I get, I get told that all the time. Yeah. I go, it's great that it's running fine. Yeah. Give me a piece of your budget. Right. I will show you how much better it can be, mm. and then we can have a conversation. Exactly. And I'm not saying stop doing what you're doing. Right. I'm just saying the idea of, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. It's fine in many instances. Don't get me wrong, it absolutely is. But if you're sitting there thinking, how do I grow my business? Right. You know, but if you know, insanity is doing the same thing, expecting yes. different results. Yes. So if you say we're never going to move away from radio, radio yes. is the holy grail for us, you don't even know that it could be better. And the big risk to a company is yeah. these days there is someone out there who's going to embrace, can this be better? Yes. So while you dig in your heels on traditional media and someone else embraces digital, guess what? Yeah. You're going to wake up one morning and say, how the heck did this happen? Yes. They just passed us yep. by a mile yep. because you haven't evolved. Yep. And that knowledge gap of not knowing is not a problem. Right. When clients call us here at Elite and they say, hey, you know, we're looking for an agency, I don't say to them, what tactics are you looking to do? Right. I don't need them to know that. Right. What I need them to tell me is, you know, what are you good at? What's your unique value proposition? Mm -hmm. What makes you special? Mm -hmm. And where do you want to go? What's your goals? What does success look like to you? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to get leads? Are you trying to get people into your right. store? What right. do you want? Once you tell me where you are and where you want to be, we map out the digital tactics you should use, and then we come back to you saying, hey, all those things on the menu that you didn't even know exist, yes. this is the menu, this is the marketing mix yeah. you want, this is gonna achieve your goals, I just need you to say go, right. and then we execute right. on that. Right. But now we might be doing 10 things that they didn't even know exist. Right. Even some of the biggest brands in the country, I'll go to a brand planning meeting with them, and I'll be like, hey guys, did you know we could geofence conferences? And did you know we could do remarketing? And did you know we could do this, this, and that? And they're like, what? What do you mean we could do that? And these are some of the biggest brands. They have no and idea. that's okay. There's yeah. supposed to be a knowledge gap. They know what they know better than I do. Right. We know what we know. Where the magic is when we come together as a unified team, and that's one of our things as well, is we don't act as an agency, we act as an extension of your team. Right. We want to be insiders, right. not outsiders. Right. We are co-marketing managers with you. Right. We're bringing our expertise to the table. Right. You're bringing your expertise. Yeah. It's the collective of that. Yes. that that's what we need. Yeah. I don't need to know everything they know, and they don't need to know yes. what I know. Yes. But if they proceed with just assuming they know it all, or we proceed knowing we know it all, we have to be aware there's a gap. Right. And when you fill that gap, that's when you really move the needle. Wow. Yeah, that, that is spot on. I couldn't have said that better. And I think, I think that that's the problem. I think a lot of them, too, are looking at it too micro. They're looking at it, well, no, social media is not for our business. Our customers don't use social media. That, it's not about the micro. It's like you're saying, take it back to the business. People are people. You're trying to get in front of customers. You don't have to know the tactical. You don't have to make the assumption you know how we're going to do it with what we're doing it, whether it's social media or Google ads. You don't need to know the details. Just know that 
give us the goal, give us the business objective, enlighten us on the brand and the vision of what makes you unique and let us show you what we can do. Don't worry about the micro of each platform because at the end of the day, I've had that said to me so many times, which is like, oh, our customers aren't on Facebook. It only works when we, they're only in that newspaper. Your customers are human. It doesn't matter. People will literally have this thing in their head that like, I can't put it out on Facebook because our, our customers, it's, it's too professional. They won't buy something on Facebook. Whether that CEO is on Facebook checking his grandson's pictures or on LinkedIn, all professional, or reading the Bloomberg news report, it's the same guy. So if you get the Absolutely. right messaging, the right creative, am I right? A hundred percent. I mean, yeah. you know, if I talk to any client, and I mean from the biggest brands in the country to the small entrepreneurs starting right. out, don't tell me that your target audience isn't on the internet. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. It's now 2020, which is crazy. There is, you know, there is no one who's like, you know what, that internet is just not a thing for right. me. Right. Right. Okay. And these days, I mean, I've been doing this for so long, so I remember when the internet was only on your computer. Right. I remember when the internet was, you know, there was no graphics because it was loading yeah. too slow, line yeah. by line. Now, you know, my kids. Okay, so I have a I have a seven, five, and two year old. Right. They're on the internet almost. I want to say from birth. Right? They, know, they knew how to type their name on the iPad yep. before they could write their name. Yep. So these days, these digital natives are growing up with it. Yes. But even the sort of older generation, yep. right? they are all on the internet all day, every day. You of can't course. find someone who's not. So the idea of my customers aren't on social network or internet or searching or anything else, I don't care who your audience is. Right. If you're saying that, you should stop right away and say, you know what, if I'm thinking that, there's something I don't know. Yeah. I don't understand how digital exactly. targeting works. I don't understand which audience is on LinkedIn for a B2B campaign or right. Instagram or search right. marketing or right. how SEO comes into play. Right. If you're thinking that digital marketing is not for you, yeah. you should stop and say, I don't know why digital marketing is for me. Yeah. And that's a different mindset. Yeah, I love that. And I think if they could be more open to that as business owners and leaders, they're gonna open up to so much more opportunity. Because there's still, the beauty of digital and online is there is still so much missed opportunity. There's so much money left on the table. So if they can just be open to, okay, if I think that my customers aren't there, I think that doesn't work for me, I must not know something. Let me find somebody who does yeah. and put my trust in them as well. Absolutely. I mean, I, I literally walk into meetings where they'll be like, you know, our whole marketing team has been sitting around scratching our heads. How are we going <laughs> to, what are we going to do in 2020 yeah. to grow the business? And we just, we can't figure it out. We can't figure it out. And inside of five minutes, I can yeah. give them 10 good ideas. Exactly. And they're like, we've spent hours in this room whiteboarding. Yeah. We've come up with nothing. And I go, that's okay, guys. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. Exactly. Embrace that. Exactly. Bring someone like Elite Digital or another yeah. agency to the table. Right. Let us fill in some of those knowledge gaps right. for you. Right. And then you can look at a menu of, oh wow, we could do that, right. this will work. Right. And the nice thing that I love about digital, which is great, again, regardless of what size business you are, mm -hmm. everything is measurable. It's yes. one of my favorite things yeah. about digital versus traditional. So we have a team here of data scientists. Yep. They're analysts, but I think data scientists sound Sounds cool. better. Okay? So our analysts are looking at raw data all the time. Right. They're presenting that to the rest of the team. We turn raw data into insights and insights into action. Right. And the fact that we can follow that formula means the right answer is there. The analytics tell us what's working and what's not. Mm -hmm. Instagram is outperforming Facebook. Twitter is outperforming LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Right? Search is outperforming this. The information's there. Mm -hmm. So where the secret sauce is on a lot of this isn't so much the we're going to roll out the campaign. Once we have a campaign live, it's looking at the data in real time. Mm. We give our clients real-time business intelligence dashboards. They see what we're seeing. Yep. And we can optimize a campaign to say, let's play with all these levers. Let's move things around so that what's working, we're doing more of. What's not working, exactly. we're doing less of. And the fact that we're literally pivoting on things every single day yeah. means every day we're challenging ourselves to be better. Yes. So where you start and where you end yes. is different. Yeah. I joke with you know a lot of traditional marketers. I say, if I give you a media plan today, you know here's your Excel file. It's outdated the second you look at it. Yeah. When you're doing broadcast and radio, you can drive that for 52 weeks. Yeah. Here, five minutes later, it's outdated because my guys are here making changes all the time right. because we have so much information. Exactly. And if you don't use that, if you adopt a set it and forget it approach, yeah. you're not realizing the benefits. Yeah. But when you're especially a small business thinking I have to maximize every single dollar, mm -hmm. we have to be looking at that because yeah. if we wait 30 days to make a change, I just miss 30 days of making something better. Yeah. I agree. And that's really why digital becomes so much more powerful in my opinion. I mean, all biases aside, the fact that you have that real-time feedback loop, the fact that you can test so many things at once, change so quickly, adapt so quickly, that in and of itself, by default, almost makes it better. Absolutely. Right? I mean, and again, I'm not knocking traditional media, right. but how many exact people looked at that ad and then went here and right. you know, how many people did that? 
With digital, I know which ad they saw. I right. know we're doing A-B testing, which ad they saw, which landing page they went to, yep. where they clicked, what they did, how long they spent, did they add it to their cart, did they check out, exactly. did they sign up for your mailing list. I have so much data that it almost becomes data overload. Yes. But when you actually have a team that can understand and synthesize that data down to something that isn't, you know, hey client, here's 50 pages of Excel data, good right, luck. Right. But rather, here's five bullet points that are the answers to the top questions you've been asking. Yes, yes. That data has now formulated a strategy that we couldn't have done in the absence of that data. Right. And that data doesn't exist in traditional media, but in digital media, it's all there and it's there in real time. Hmm, I like it. So let's talk about it a little bit for a second about the small businesses. And let, let's, let's just even classify it as very small. Five to 10 employees, they're growing, they're building, and they believe in this. They're buying in right now. They're hearing it and saying, okay, I got it. I want in on digital. What's your advice to these small businesses? Because digital is such a broad landscape. Where does the small business start? So I think, I mean, I always tell small businesses, who's the low hanging fruit, mm. right? So. If you think of your conversion goal, which is, you know, here's where I want them to end up, right. which could be buying a product online, could be coming into my store, could be, you know, filling out a lead form, any yes. of those things. That the low hanging fruit is the people most likely to convert. Mm -hmm. In once you know what that is, you can figure out the right tactic. So for a lot of small businesses, it's going to be search marketing. Right. Okay. I, you know, I could service customers who are a 10 minute drive from my retail location. Yeah. So that's going to be my radius. I want to find customers who are searching for this. Mm -hmm. My store is only open at this hour, so I can constrain it to that. Right. So I'm going to do hmm. search marketing. Mm -hmm. Social media is also incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And a lot of small businesses who don't have necessarily a budget for paid media mm -hmm. can do a really good organic strategy. Right. Right. How can you establish thought leadership through organic social media yep. where you're not even spending dollars? Yeah. I always say you can outspend the competition. You could also out hustle the competition. Yeah. And when you're just starting out, and I say this from experience, yep. you have to out hustle them. I'm yet to talk to a client that says, we have an unlimited budget, go to town, spend whatever you want. Yeah. No, no, we have to out hustle. We have to try harder than yes. the other people. That's how yes. we win the race. Yeah. So when you're a small business figuring out where you should start, maybe it is organic social media, so you don't have to pay much mm. for it. Maybe it is paid social media, mm -hmm. maybe it's paid search. Mm -hmm. What I would say to them is do a test and learn. Don't blow your whole budget on one tactic Agreed. and then say, oh man, it worked or it didn't. Yeah. Dabble in A, dabble in B, dabble yeah. in C, and just measure it. And the nice thing is, it's not like you need a ton of money to try it out. Right. You can have a very small budget and try something out and measure it. Try something out, measure it. Mm. And then sit back and say, what gave me the highest ROI? What gave me the best bang right. for my buck? Now I know where to focus. Mm -hmm. So before I start ruling out channels, I would say, how many channels can I test in my little experiment here? Right. And then see what does best. And here's a great question I know a lot of these small business owners will ask. Timeline wise, how long should they be testing and trying? Is it something that I can run search ads for a week and know if it's good or not? Do I have to do it for three months, six months, a year? What does that test look like for them? So I think it's, a, it's always a great question. I get asked it all the time. Right. And it's always, you know, how big a sample size do you need for it to be significant? Exactly. And it varies. And I always say it's less about calendar time and more about almost the sample size. Right. So if you run, you know, if you have a search term that everybody's searching for every day and you can get tons and tons of clicks inside of a few days, right. you may not need more than a few days to sit back and say, hey, what's happening? Right. If you're getting two clicks a day, you can't make a decision after day right. one, right? So it's really about hmm. at what point do we have enough information that this matters? A hundred people have clicked. Can I draw enough insight? If 100 people clicked and the insight is very obvious, you have a big enough sample size to right. know what's working and not. If two people click, you don't, you don't have that. So it's less about the, oh, I better wait three months, right. and more about the, I wanna have enough time to make sure I don't make a decision on flawed data. So I have one client where they launched a search marketing campaign and there was a snowstorm that day. Mm -hmm. So not a lot of people saw the ad and went to their store because everyone was hibernating here in Canada, right, right or in Toronto. So, for them to draw a conclusion of, I guess this doesn't work, right. is flawed. There was right. something that impacted that. Right. So for that person to do a one day test makes no sense. But if they ride it out for enough, you know, enough of a duration, and I often say, you know, if I have to put a calendar time to it, I like a three month test where there's not, you know, too much action and you can control right. your budget. Yeah. Just because you also want to alleviate seasonality. Yes. I've seen clients say, I launched my campaign on Saturday and by Monday I stopped it and this sucks. Well, maybe it'd be better during the week. <laughs> right, so 100%. you want to make sure you're getting and making a decision based on good, significant data. Right. And then draw your insight from that. Don't have two people click and say, I guess this landing page is better. That's hmm. too small.
I love it. I, you're taking words right out of my mouth. It's exact. That's exactly my answer. So that's fantastic. Awesome. Um, because I get a lot of those questions, as I'm sure. sure you do as well. 100%. And, so, and it's good that people are asking the question, right, right. because it's worse if they just make an assumption or don't know. Mm -hmm. I could do this for a day, or I have. To, I've had people say, "I guess if I don't try it for a year, I can't try it at all." Mm -hmm. I'm like, "Where did you read that? Who mm -hmm. told you that?" Mm -hmm. So I think asking for the entrepreneur to ask questions is important. Right. And you can call us up here and start asking questions. You don't, like, we talk to clients all the time where we're mapping out, you know, what can you do and, and what are the options. That's okay. Every entrepreneur, if you're not asking lots of questions, you're not doing this right. Right, right. I love it. So back to your agency just for a second. I mean, you've had all this success. You've grown this agency. You worked with all these great clients, learned all these great lessons. What does the next 10 years look like for you and for Elite Digital? I hope it's as wild and crazy as, <laughs> as the last 10 years, to be honest. Because like I said, I love it as much today as I did before. I think digital is constantly evolving. It's another thing I love about it. Tactics we're going to roll out for 2020 mm -hmm. are different than what we did mm -hmm. in 2019. It'll be different five years from now. I think for us, it's about keeping our clients ahead of the game. Right. So for us, it's about growing and evolving. But for us, it's really about strengthening relationship with our clients because we're in it to win it with them. Mm -hmm. We're a team of one. We're united with them. So they expect us to know what's coming tomorrow. Right. Right. I want to bring our clients the solution of tomorrow, today, and always keep them ahead of the curve because if my clients are ahead of the curve, they're going to win that race. They're going to win that game. Hmm. So we're going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to evolve. We're going to continue to challenge ourselves. We're going to continue to nurture our, our staff and our amazing team that we have yeah, here yeah. because my goal you know, 10 years from now would be to see the same faces I see out there today, but yeah. everyone is just smarter and better and knows it all and they feel great. Yes. But at the same time, they still feel challenged. Yes. I never want to be complacent. Yeah. Yeah. We're on a constant quest for improvement, and I think that's so core to the sort of elite culture is together as a unified team, we want to always be better. And I never want to stand up in front of the staff and say, we've achieved greatness, that's it, we've peaked, we're done, <laughs> this is the end of the journey. I never want to yeah, stay no. there because as soon as you think that, you're in trouble, and there's going to be someone else who is waiting behind you who says, I'm going to keep on hustling. And the same effort I put in today is the same effort I put in when I was a teenager. And I think it's going to be the same effort I put in for the next 10 years. And based on where we've been, I can't wait to see where we're going. I love it. And just to steal some top secret information for some of the, the business owners that are watching, when you talk about keeping on top of those trends as we move into the future, what do you see right now? I mean, as far as you can see, do you see any particular trends in terms of maybe one platform working better than the other or something like search working better than social or a new technology maybe we've never even heard about? What do you see coming down the pipeline? So I think it's going to be a lot of the savviness at which we use the current channels. Mm. So you're going to see a lot more now what we do for our clients, a lot of cross-channel media buying. Ah. So it's not that I'm on one, I'm on search or I'm on Facebook right. or Twitter or Instagram. Where we're, where we're going to see this going is the sophistication. Hmm. The data is getting better. The understanding of how we can take consumer behavior and use that to our advantage across everything they're doing. As we move to a more connected world, yep. which is where we're going, right? Soon your, your fridge is going to be on the internet and your alarm clock's on yep. the internet and your yep. watch is on the yep. internet and That's your phone's true. on the internet. And you're, like, so everything's going to be connected. The way we're going to use all of those data points to understand how we can mobilize and change consumer behavior, that's where we're going. So it's not that the internet is going to fundamentally change, but the way we use the information and the way we get the right message in front of the right person at the right time in the right place with the right creative, yes. you're going to see a lot more dynamic creative. The ads you see are different than the ads that I see. Right. The ad you see on your phone is different than the ad you see on your desktop. Right. All of that sophistication is yeah. where the evolution is going to be. Because once we're in a connected world and there's more information, marketers can be more savvy to get you the right message when it matters the most. Agreed. And one last question for all the aspiring agency owners that might be watching. It's a popular thing these days. What advice do you have for those guys and girls that want to start an agency? Number one is how passionate are you about it? Mm. Are you starting an agency because you think there's nothing better to do or that sounds cool or you, you know, yeah. you heard this story and thought, well, I could do that Get as well. Get rich quick. Or are you truly, truly, truly passionate about yeah. it? Because yeah. I will tell you when starting an agency or growing an agency or running an agency at all, you have to hustle and you have yeah. to love it. Because I can't wait to get out of bed in the morning and embrace the day and embrace the challenges of what's happening. That's amazing. And I think if you're sitting there going, is agency life right for me? I will tell you, I love it. It's amazing. We do such fun things here. It's amazing. But it. if you're not ready to give it 110% effort yeah. every single day, it's probably not right for you. Because there is someone who's going to put in that yeah. effort and they're going to win. So I think yeah. that's the key thing to understand. And if you are ready to put in that effort, then I think understanding what can you focus on first? What pain point can you solve for your potential clients? Mm -hmm. Start with that and then expand. 
don't try to do it all right away. Mm, I love it. Okay, if anyone wants to reach out to you or connect with you, where can they find you? You can tell the camera right there. Absolutely. So uh, Elite Digital, you can find us at EliteDigitalAgency.com. Check it out. You find us on all the social channels. You could find me on Twitter and Instagram at Robert Burko. And certainly if you have any questions, Elite Digital Agency, we are always here to help every size business because everybody here loves it as much as I do. And we are keen to help your business and organization and brand no matter what stage you're at. Awesome, Robert. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time, man. Thank I you. love it. I'm awesome. sure they loved it and hopefully we thank can have you. you back soon. Awesome. Thank you very much. Awesome. Cheers. You've been listening to the Obscurity to Authority podcast. Tune in again next week with your host, Darren Cabral, as he explores the blueprint of success.